evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Mahoning Drive-In Theater, the largest single-screen drive-in in the United States. We're certainly glad you could be with us this evening. And don't forget the concession stand is open with all kinds of great things to eat and drink. Eighty-nine point three Mahoning Drive-In Radio. Your old friend Virgil back once again for another amazing episode of the podcast. And for those of you guys that are new to the podcast, welcome to the family. We shine a light on the drive-in culture and specifically get into the behind-the-scenes action at the Mahoning Drive-In Theater. And uh, now that we are jumping into the uh, off-season, kind of settling into the off-season, we figured let's uh, let's do some flashback episodes, bring in some guests to remember some of the fun of 2021 and of course today we got mark say hello mark hello mark and very special guest uh our good friend robert from the projection booth how are you my friend ahoy hoy i'm well how are you very good it's great to uh hear your voice we saw each other at the 24 hour thon and actually talked about it on a, a previous episode. So if you guys want to check that out, and it's always a treat having Robert in. Uh, for those of you guys that don't know, you can go back and listen to kind of the intro at the beginning of the season as Robert was jumping into things as uh, what would become really the right hand of Jeff in the projection booth. And uh, on most nights, really running the projection booths. So uh, how do you feel going from the beginning of the season to now? You feel a little more seasoned? <laughs> like a well-done steak, if that's what you mean. I am <laughs> very tired, and I'm excited to do it again, but I'm very grateful now that I'll have much more of a proper level of expectation of just how much work is required. Oh, it's insanity, and we, we, we've been doing the math, and in the off-season, we like to do that on how well certain events do, blah, 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 but we did almost 100 events this year and you know it traditional events at the Mahoning are at least two movies so uh yeah Robert ran some film this year <laughs> I mean there were periods of time in that projection booth where it was hard to physically for you to get around all of the film that was in the projection booth I mean you had the films that maybe had just ended their run but you had the films that you were playing that weekend in the next few days and with you know a few exhumed events in a row where you're talking two or three nights of double or triple features it just physically literally piles up in there the island of film and you know why don't you talk about the process a little bit robert because you're responsible for most nights of inspecting the film which most people probably don't know what goes into that and of course, running the film. So what's the workload as far as uh, inspecting the film? I know you liked to uh, have all the films prepped and ready on the day. That kind of became your groove, but I'm sure that was a learning thing from the beginning of the year. Ideally, I'd like to have them ready before the day, but it's just not always possible. It depends on when the films themselves arrive. It depends on how many movies there were previously and whether or not you have the room to have the new movies on house reels. Um, for those of the, those listeners who don't know, house reels are typically metal reels. We like to use those for playing the films versus the plastic reels that films are usually shipped on. If they're even shipped on reels at all, sometimes they come on cores, which are just little pieces of plastic that the film is wrapped around on. And you need something called a split reel in order to transfer those to another kind of reel. And, and sometimes it just depends on my own personal life. I have a day job, which is 40, sometimes 50 hours every week on top of working at the theater. So it takes a lot of preparation and time management. And I'm a lot better at it now because I know a lot more about um, just how to effectively prioritize different tasks. And if you um, say have a working rewinder in the projection booth, that makes it a lot easier. For a little while this year, our rewinder was broken, as you both probably recall. Oh, so yeah. that to do everything by hand for a little while, which gets very tiresome and can lead to one looking like they play tennis full time because your one side is going to be much more toned than the other. Yeah. <laughs> your Hulk on the one side. <laughs> you can really only rewind with your right hand in our projection booth as it's set up. Yeah, I don't even know if I'm answering the original question at this point. There's a lot involved 
when it comes to inspecting the films, I want to always at least inspect the heads and tails of each print. But going forward, if I have the time and I'm going to try and make it, I want to inspect the full prints before each show or not before each show, but before we play each movie the first time, at least, because there are times when there's something that is uh, not going to play. We saw that with um I want to say the ghost of Frankenstein. I don't remember which one it was this year at the Universal Monsters weekend, but yes. there was a splice on that movie that if it had been done by Ray Charles, it would have been fine. <laughs> such as it was, it was not lined up properly. So it's no surprise that that thing flew off the track in the projector during the movie, forcing us to temporarily stop the show. Now, there's a, 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 you said, you know, how the films arrive, whether they're on reels or on cores. We received uh, one or two copies of a print of a film for a festival early this season that uh, <laughs> I won't name the studio. <laughs> I won't name the film title, but it, it, they had, they happened to find a print in their warehouse or their basement of this film we were about to show. And you opened the can and it, it was it was as so much celluloid spaghetti inside. They, I, I don't know how that film was put into the can that way, if there was a core anywhere to be found in that can, but it was like, it was like a reel of film exploded, but did not disintegrate inside the film. Yeah, it was like snake, snake in a can. You open it up and it's like, <laughs> yeah, it was on a core. All the reels were on cores, but that was it. And I imagine not having the reels there to buffer it a little bit more probably accelerated the uh, unwinding of that film because it wasn't taped down properly. If you don't use a nice, long, new piece of tape when you secure film for shipment, there is a better than even chance that it's going to become dislodged in time. And yeah, then you get what you saw, which was kind of a worst case scenario. It took us, and by us, I mean Jeff and myself, Jeff jumped in because he saw how bad it was and he was able to get that ready to play. But even with his experience and, and expertise, it still took us close to three hours to fix that movie and get it ready for showtime. Unfortunately, that was also the first movie of the <laughs> night. And on top of which, that made it more difficult to make sure the movie was in the right order, which normally isn't a problem. But sometimes the person who plays the movie before you doesn't put it back in the right order or even in this case, mislabels it. So memory serves, this was a six reel film and you play a six reel film, reels one, two, three, four, five, six, but by mistake, because I couldn't catch it in time without the proper time to really inspect it. And I didn't know the movie as well as some others. Right. We played movie reels one, two, three, five, four, six. So <laughs> the climactic car chase was bisected by a flashback to about 40 minutes earlier in the movie. And there were probably some people who knew what was going on well before I did. I had a moment of shock at that second to last real change. <laughs> and then I realized there was very little I could have done to fix it. And in fact, one of our guests who was there just for that movie, she drove a, a considerable distance only to see that movie because she knew she had to leave right away afterwards for work in the morning. Yeah. And she said on Twitter that she loved that it happened that it was a close to one of a kind experience. I can't imagine it's happened much, if ever, before. And uh, I'm, I'm actually hoping to take that movie and uh, take my Blu-ray of it and re-edit it into our <laughs> version and watch it someday the like way the they thought. Cut. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm able to do that because I had to take pictures of the heads and tails of the rest of the reels in order to properly reorder the movie before shipping. I wanted to be absolutely certain that I sent it back in the correct order relabeled so that that doesn't happen again that's something worth mentioning so you know now that i've been working in the industry i've, I've both indoor and at the mahoning i've come across many a projectionist but you have something very special about you you like to watch each film before you run it what's your thought behind that to kind of see where everything's going to know what to look for it helps me make sure that um, the movie's in frame. Sometimes the negative on the film is uh, a different aspect ratio. It could look like it's a, uh, say an Academy ratio film, which is 1.33 dimension, four by three. So like an old television, basically, something like Gone with the Wind or The Wizard of Oz is a four by three film. 
but just because it's four by three on the negative doesn't mean that that's what's intended to be on the screen. And uh, Mulholland Drive is actually a good example of that. You could play that movie in that aspect ratio and it might look fine. I don't know if you're gonna see boom mics or anything at the top of the frame. I haven't watched that version of the movie. Very few people probably have, but David Lynch had specific instructions for that film where he requested projectionists have the frame line, I believe just a little bit higher than usual. And with enough experience, that might be something I'd be confident just doing by instinct, but I'm not there. And uh, I don't know if I ever will be to my satisfaction. So what I did in this case was I brought the movie with me. I brought my DVD and I played it and used that as a reference to make sure that the frame lines were exactly where they were intended to be. And fortunately, it didn't take that long, a little bit of time on reel one and then a little bit of time on reel two. And as long as you keep everything in frame for the rest of the show, you should be good. And as memory serves, I did. So I am uh, fortunate to have the means to do that. As far as time goes, watching these movies beforehand helps with keeping things in frame. But even more importantly, most of the time is being able to know where the cue marks are, because sometimes a film doesn't have cue marks. Sometimes they're incredibly difficult to see. And without having done that, I definitely would have missed more changeovers than I did this year. There were a few times where I couldn't see the cue marks, but thankfully, because I inspected them beforehand, I knew where they were and I was able to react to them all the same. Didn't you say there was one print that had multiple sets of cue marks, like four or more sets of cue marks on it? Oh, there were many films that had multiple sets of cue marks. A couple of our house prints had more than two sets of cue marks. Two sets of cue marks as standard, one being to start the motor on the next projector, the other indicating the time for the changeover. But, but a lot of these grindhouse prints have many, many cue marks. I think that's probably a combination of the films having played on platters and lost so many frames from the end of the reel that they had to keep making new sets of cue marks. And there's probably also mistakes that happen. Sometimes a projectionist might inscribe cue marks in the wrong place, and then you don't have much choice but to add them in another spot. And you might be able to try and cover them up with maybe, a. Um, I think people have used black markers on cue marks to try and describe yeah. that, but you can't <laughs> totally take it away. It's inscribed on the film. This drive-in theater is radioactive. Now you can hear tonight's show on your AM car radio. Turn your ignition key to the accessory position. This will not drain your car battery. Now turn on your radio and zero in on the following AM station. Hi, I'm Chili Dilly, the personality pickle. Packed in a jar for the freshest flavor. Served cold in a sack for you to savor. So dainty to eat, no muss, no fuss. An ideal snack for all of us. Crisp, tender, and tasty with a bit of spice. Buy one now. Taste how nice. Snack bar clerks will knock themselves silly. Speeding your order for a real chilly dilly. And you're certainly one who is perfect for this because, you know, again, you're meticulous. And it's worth talking about a lot of times when we are borrowing from a private collector and sometimes high profile uh, private collectors, these prints will come with literal instructions and it'll 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 kind of lay out what they expect of the projectionist and it's something obviously at the Mahoning we don't take lightly. Absolutely. I remember one print we got from a friend of Harry's that is Harry Guero of Exhumed Films. And I didn't meet the owner of this print, but it was the last minute substitution because I think that the studio couldn't find their print or something to that effect. Whatever the cause was, he had to go to a friend to play that one movie on film uh, that was uh, eaten alive. And it was very particular for us in that the owner of that print did not want it put in the mechanical rewinder. He wanted that film wound by hand. Right. So that was a, uh, an extra step. But in order to um, satisfy the requirements of playing it on 35, more than worthwhile. The other that comes to mind is Tarantino's archives, which do not 
allow you to alter their films in any way. And for that, I'm grateful. The responsibility is just too high. They don't want you to remove any frames. You're not allowed to add cue marks, and you certainly should never add cue marks anymore unless you own that print. But even then, I would imagine you would much rather use a, a, a grease pencil, which I have in the projection booth. With Tarantino's prints, you're also not even allowed to insert the film into the slots on the reels, which normally are there to hold the film. But that does damage it, and that will affect the lifespan of that print. And I was happy for that because it actually made me a better projectionist because now I don't need to use those slots and I'm much better at getting the films ready to play. The other thing that comes to mind about that is when we played Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, that was not a um, personal print of Tarantino's. We played his personal copies of uh, Kill Bill Volumes 1 and 2, Pulp Fiction, True Romance, but... Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was a studio print that came from Sony. And that one was interesting because it was obvious it had played on a platter or more than one platter or somewhere, which usually isn't allowed anymore, but they must make exceptions. And it had been spliced. The heads and tails were removed so that they could put it all together on one big platter. And there were no cue marks, save for the first reel. I'm not sure why only the first reel had cue marks on it, but... I had to go and add cue marks to the rest of the print, which basically involved a lot of counting. Counting, I think, 24 frames from the end of each reel. I mimicked how the first reel was laid out for the rest of the film so it was consistent. And I had myself like a full second of film after that last changeover cue. And then counting, I want to say it was 172 frames for the next set of cue marks. I don't remember exactly, but it was like about seven and a half seconds worth of the film. Yeah, it's it's amazing. I mean, it, it was a wild ride for us in the projection booth. A lot of ups, a lot of downs, but let's go back, take a trip down memory lane. So we opened up a little early this season in April and we came out swinging as we like to, but uh, opening weekend was first weekend in April. Then we had remake double take with The Blob. Then we had the Wolfman's Got Nards documentary with Monster Squad. Then we had the Exhumed event, the 80s event. And then we had our dark side of Disney to wrap out April. Anything jump out about those events as far as the projection side of things? You started right away. There wasn't like a, hey, I'll be here three weeks in. You were there running that first weekend. Right? Yeah, and I don't remember anything particular about those weekends except for that we had to play all digital for the wolfman's got nards weekend they wouldn't release the print of monster squad and wolfman's got nards is new and does not have any prints in existence so that was a nice weekend where i didn't have to do that much work and something i would very very much look forward to at any possible opportunity for the next set <laughs> We'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll take that into uh, consideration next year. With us. you've heard it here, we've gone all digital. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If anybody questions why there might be a digital showing next year, it's to, it's to give Robert a breather. <laughs> Strategically placed throughout the year, and maybe some of those late late shows. Which you know, when when uh, on a few occasions, I don't remember how many. I think twice this year, films didn't show up, and we yeah. had to play something digitally instead. And in the one instance, the decision was made to actually switch that feature because most of the people who come, come for the 35. And they um, deliberately then played the digital feature last, which is probably the best call. And as far as uh, a, a night with three, or in some cases rare, but in some cases four movies in a night, having that fourth feature be digital does take the edge off a little bit because you're chasing daylight by the time some of those shows are over and uh, we're only human. From the creator of Halloween and the star of The Exorcist, Linda Blair in Hell Night. Garth Manor, where the unseen, the unspeakable, hides its terror in cobwebbed corridors. Linda Blair, Vincent Van Patten, and Peter Barton in Hell Night. From Compass International, rated R, under 17, not admitted without parent. Mmm, savory barbecue beef. Go ahead, fix a sandwich for yourself. Just look at that pure prime beef simmering in that special tangy barbecue sauce. Make a big one. 
like you do for the customers. Customers? Uh-oh. Well, somebody got it. Have to fix yourself another. Savory barbecued beef. There's still plenty for you at the refreshment center. Hey, everybody. This is Zach Allegan from Gremlins and Waxwork and all sorts of other movies you probably saw at the drive-in. You're listening to Mahoning Drive-In Radio. That type of stuff we've talked about on the podcast before, I chalk it up to studios kind of living in a, a previous time period when it was kind of the norm to get a print the week of to somebody. But now post-COVID, as you know, being the person who also ships back each print, um, you know, the, the postal system's a little questionable. <laughs> Yeah, with the exception of the uh, universal prints, which are cash on delivery. So those are set up for Jeff to receive at his day job. I receive most of them, uh, non, non-exhumed non films. Harry takes care of those, of course. And anything from Tarantino goes to Harry, and Harry brings them to us. But um, yeah, the amount of trips to FedEx this year and the uh, time spent waiting for FedEx to show up with prints is a little bit nerve-wracking, hopefully less so this coming year. Nothing will beat that weekend, though, where a uh, movie that shall go unnamed didn't show up until the night of and really not more than 15 minutes before showtime. (laughs) The adventures in the projection booth. I'm sure you can collect these stories for the book. (laughs) I guess they'll have a book at some point. And thank you, Tina, for delivering that print to us on time. Oh, yeah. That night, we were we who were in the know in the inner circle were like, you know, we're partway through the 10 minute intermission countdown reel and the next movie isn't here yet. And she got it in here just in time and you worked diligently. I think you had it ready to go. Like, I thought you would be having to inspect and build the print as the reels were running of the movie in progress. But I think you said you had it ready to go before the film started that night. I think I had three reels ready to go before the film started. Uh, I don't remember precisely, but I think I had three reels out of five ready to go. And that was a print that came to us tails out, which makes my job easier. Then you can just inspect the tail of the film, rewind it, heads out, inspect the head, and then it's ready to play. That is uh, as long as you're not inspecting the entire print, which in that case would not have been possible. But I do hope to actually do that next year. And I'm repeating myself on this podcast so that it's like a commitment I need to hold myself to. (laughs) You said it twice. There is one thing that you've mentioned to me that I find interesting is in a technical aspect. If a splice in a film is not done the right way, once the splice passes through the gate, the uh, picture is out of frame. You see, you know, the head is at the bottom of the screen and the feet are at the top for people who don't know what I'm talking about. What is that that causes uh, it to be out of frame? Well, a, a, a frame of film is um, the width of four sprockets, the sprocket holes being on the left and right side to pass through the projector with the, the gears moving them. And um, if you cut the frame of film improperly at um, you know one of the odd numbered sprocket holes if that's the proper nomenclature i'm not sure um then yeah you'll probably have a line obviously through the picture either halfway or one quarter down or one quarter up from the bottom and you might see you know you'll, you'll see the whole movie but you're going to see it in a way that's very visually unappealing i think the best example of this in in the world that i know of is in um, duck amuck when the the film quote unquote breaks at one point and suddenly there's two daffy ducks to spar with each other. And I always, I will always say it on the show and and in person, whenever there's a real change and the picture is out of frame, if I'm outside watching the film and I have my little walkie talkie that we all use to communicate staff wise on the lot during a show, before I get it up to my mouth, you've already fixed it. Like it's always, you're always just right on top of, you know, paying attention and caring because I've been oh, in yeah. 35 days. I went to a lot of theaters where something would go wrong and it would just run until I had to get up and tell somebody that it was fixed. So it's always nice to have a projectionist who's keeping an eye on the ball or, you know, the image on the screen, as it were. I'm somebody who, generally speaking, will rather, I would rather watch a movie in some manner that's incorrect, you know, if the screen isn't matted properly or something to that effect. 
then miss some of the movie because you can get up and try and find someone who's going to know what to do and fix it. But by the time that that's taken care of, assuming you even can get it fixed, you're going to miss five to 10 minutes of the movie maybe. And um, to me, that's just not worthwhile. You have one chance to get it right for the audience. And I try and hold myself to a very high standard so that I do get it right most of the time. And I have some regrets. There were some mistakes I made. One that was, I would say, a, a lack of common sense. And um, I'm oddly grateful for that experience because it will never happen again as a result of that. And you will know what that was, Mark, because you were there for Go Ape Night. That was when Planet of the Apes broke in the projector. Oh, oh, oh yes. I forgot. There was a very chatty guest in the projection booth at that time. And in part because <laughs> of that very chatty guest, I didn't realize there was no sound. And if oh. you're playing if you're playing a movie and there's no sound, there's almost always something wrong. And because of that, I didn't realize right away that the film had broken and it was building up and up inside the projector. This was real two on Planet of the Apes. And then I made probably the worst decision I made all year, which was to try and play that reel of film again from the beginning. And you absolutely cannot play damaged film from the beginning, as we all found out very quickly when it got caught again and started to burn. And I hope that that print can play as is. It seems to be ready to play again as is without having to remove anything from it. But the fact is, is that beautiful 50 year old original print of the movie now has at least 15 or 20 seconds that are kind of, eh, and that's my fault and I'm gonna have to live with it. Yeah, well, like, like Mark said, you're somebody who truly cares. I think that we've always had our kind of pre-show announcements and uh, information center on the radio, but you really added an aspect this year as far as letting the audience know the respect level that we hold them to. And we've always been known as the drive-in who is very loose with their rules, very open about their letting their fan base in and freak flags flying. But there needs to be somebody who is setting those folks who might get out of line during a film straight. And you do really, really uh, great work on that front. I hope that that starts to take hold too. And I thank you for that because there were some uh, very disappointing shows this year where there were some guests who do not know how to behave themselves, who ruined the movies for a lot of people, including myself. I'm not out there watching them, but the presentation and the experience of, I don't care if it's two people or 200 people matters to me personally. And if you think that you're special and you can sit in the front row and make jokes like you're on Mystery Science Theater, you got another thing coming. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking we might need to get some more bouncers in the future if that doesn't change. Well, our lock crew is uh, known for making the rounds. And like you said, this is a learning process. There's certain things that you will never do, certain things that we learn on the lot without a doubt. And I think a big part of the problem we had with that specific area, we got a donation of these really nice kind of like park benches, you know, where you can sit and kind of eat. And as soon as we put those out, naturally, a certain crowd congregates to it and uh, has has some fun hanging out on the park benches. So it's weird because as soon as we moved them, that kind of went away. <laughs> we figured it out. Hi, folks. I'm Rico. Oh, Nacho. He's Peppy. See. Si. You can find us at the concession stand in the lobby. Along with all sorts of other tasty goodies. See. Si. Rico's Nachos, a refreshingly new and different snack discovery. Chock full of high quality ingredients, crisp fresh tortilla chips, covered with creamy aged cheddar cheese, topped off with zesty jalapeno pepper rings. Rico's Nachos, out of sight. Remember, folks, we're the new star at the snack bar. Rico's Nachos, a new taste treat you can't beat. See? Rico's Nachos, on sale at the snack bar now. So I can say it, May, I think, was when things really started to uh, light up. And I know this is probably your favorite event, but May, we had Vamp Party, uh, the Hammer Horror Edition. We had the David Lynch event. We had Real Rumble Weekend. And we had, of course, Exhumed Films Zombie Fest, which had a pre-show of Dawn of the Dead. Now, you've said it, that David Lynch weekend was something else. 
That was. That would have probably been my favorite event of the year, even without, we'll call them the extracurricular aspects to it. We had some incredible guests there, and I had an incredibly sublime moment of doing a changeover for Twin Peaks Fire Walk with me, while I want to say four cast members from Twin Peaks, the show, were yeah. watching and then applauding after the changeover was completed. And um, yeah, I mean, just on every cylinder that weekend was out of the park, the quality of the movies. I know David Lynch is divisive, and at least one of my friends just doesn't groove on him, and that makes me sad because I get so much out of those movies on a personal level. And yeah. that was um, the first weekend of the year that sold out too, if memory serves. Maybe not both, right. times, but the one night with Twin Peaks and Mulholland Drive sold out very quickly. And I was very proud of that fact because those do not strike a lot of people as drive-in type movies. But I hope that we can change that perspective and start showing all kinds of movies and bringing out giant, giant crowds like that. And um, oh, yeah. then on top of everything, we had a surprise guest that weekend when Rebecca Del Rio showed up without any previous announcements. There was a generous donation made that allowed her to show up and be a part of the pre-show. She sang with, um, what was the name of that band? One of you surely knows. F.U. Tammy is the polite version of their band name. Okay. There was um, something to do with her handler. I don't know exactly what, but she was not able to get back and forth from her hotel and then also needed a ride to the airport following the end of that weekend. And um, I was uh, asked to help take care of her by uh, Faye. Yeah, this so that was an amazing feat for Faye this season. And uh, maybe you'll be able to ask her this year because she'll be back. Uh, we're kind of doing a flip-flop between the David Lynch event and the Mad Max event. So uh, she'll be back certainly, it looks like, maybe in May. So hopefully she's got a great outfit for her little munchkin. I'd only, uh, I'd only expect that from Tank and Faye. <laughs> I'm really excited for that to come back too because I did not know Faye when the uh, Mad Max films played last season i was just an audience member at that point and i also love those movies so much so i'm gonna try to dress up as um, I don't know, probably a morton joe or something in order for, yes. to project those films i've uh i've seen them all at the drive-in on 35 now now i get to project them fingers crossed we can get all of those on film next yeah, year i think we'll luck out there was a little confusion with the last time we played it we tried to get black and chrome on 35 and they sent the regular one, so we actually ended up playing the regular one as well as Black and Chrome on digital. So, you know, memories. The, the one thing I remember from, besides that amazing moment when the cast applauded you, I remember when F.U. Tammy was singing up front, playing up front, and it was the first time that people were experiencing live music after COVID. And I had literally probably a dozen people come up and just thank us for doing this event and giving uh, them the space to come out because it was, it was such an amazing performance. And I think having that hooked into it really elevated how people felt about that performance in that night. So jumping into June, we had Thanksgiving, we had Tromathon, we had Creature Feature Convention uh, with the Kyoto Brothers, and we had uh, Drive-In Apocalypse the post-apocalyptic goodness uh, from Exhumed Films. Anything jump out that weekend? Oh, the for that month? the post-apocalypse one was really exciting for me because The Terminator is one of my favorite movies. And to be able to play that was probably very high on the bucket list. Oh, yeah. There was the Tuesday night before that where we played Terminator 2. Oh, no, that was the following Tuesday. That was the following Tuesday. Correct. Um, right I'm after that. What I'm hoping we can do, because I really thought that that was going to sell out. How that did not sell out is beyond me. But I'm hoping that at some point we can play those movies together on the same night, because I think that that is going to be an all-timer event for a lot of people, myself included. So July, that was and traditionally is the craziest month for us. It's the heart of the summer. People are kind of in that uh, vacation mode, and we get a lot of people who come in and spend a weekend with us. We had uh, the Karate Kid weekend, VHS Fest, Joe Bob weekend, Christmas in July, 
And of course, Block O Rama exhumes event in July. And VHS Fest must be nice for you because you get a little break, right? You were yeah, there. Not, not a whole lot of work to do as far as projection goes, but one of my favorite things about the drive in season is VHS Fest because of the vendors and all of the amazing tapes and movies you can find. And who knows what else people make stuff and bring that you can't get anywhere else, whether it's their own avant-garde work on videotape or I remember somebody years ago had some interesting sculptures made with like tiny bones or something like that weird stuff but you know yeah. that's 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 a good thing in my book oh without a doubt my scores this year for VHS Fest were I got the Rock'em Sock'em Terminator 2 which was displayed and still is displayed in the concession lobby which is Arnold fighting the T-1000, which is, I had the perfect comment from Dino, uh, who was a vendor and a good friend of ours that weekend. And he said, it's like the 80s and 90s had a baby, a toy baby, and here it is. <laughs> it is, it's kind of a, a perfect thing. And I scored a huge Fangoria lot. I got like, gosh, probably 100 different Fangoria magazines all in one shot. So you got to love the vendors without a doubt. And for anybody who, for some reason, doesn't understand or know what VHS Fest is, it's a weekend dedicated to VHS collecting. And we, the films we show, the reason why Rob and Jeff don't have a lot to do that weekend is the films are actually played from VHS tape via our digital booth. So usually that's Andy or somebody else is up front running the entire show that weekend. It's all videotape sourced. And yeah, the vendors are crazy. It's a lot of tapes, but it's also DVDs and Blu-rays and music. And it's a it's a good like, what do you want to call it? Alt pop culture vendors are sort of what you would arts and crafts and clothes. Yeah, and it's just like punk rock flea market. Very style. much so. And it's it's really cool. It's the weekend that I the first few years of it, I didn't go outside because I was working the cash register in the snack bar and I just knew I would go broke or want to go broker. And I just would stay inside and not even look. Now I go and I'm, I'm much more restrained in what I buy, but it's uh, it's it's exactly up our alley. If you like what we sell inside the Mahoning snack bar for for merch and media, that it's that times like a hundred outside. <laughs> you gotta love it. Thanks for coming to our show tonight. We appreciate the opportunity to serve you. We think it's great to be able to enjoy fine entertainment in the comfort and privacy of your own car. The come-as-you-are atmosphere is a pleasant way to relax in the evening. Don't you agree? Well, in August, we had Real Weird Weekend. Great memories there. We had our Adventures in Babysitting double. We had the Cage Match Weekend, our Nick Cage Weekend, and uh, Go Ape part two and we talked a little bit about the experience with uh go ape but what was it like uh for real weird weekend where do you stand on el topo real weird weekends one of my favorite weekends every year harry always has some real great double features in there and this year was unique in that we played el topo we had two yodorowski movies unfortunately only one and a half of them showed up so we had to play El Topo half on film. And then That's right. As, oh, my gosh. I almost uh, forgot. Yep. As seamlessly as. Oh, wait, I'm wrong. El Topo, we played entirely on film. It was the Holy Mountain that showed up only 50 percent. Right. So the first four reels, I think, were on film. And then we had it synced up, you and I, with the Blu-ray in the digital booth. And with just a couple of seconds between the end of the film and the start of that Blu-ray, we played that movie almost seamlessly. And everyone was very happy with it. And it saved what would otherwise have been a movie we would have just had to scratch. And thankfully, we have the means to do that, whereas other theaters would either have to just play all digital or not play the movie. I can't imagine they would want to play half the movie. <laughs> Such a magic trick moment. It, it reminds me of playing the subtitles on the through the digital booth on a 35 print. It's kind of taking what we do, the elements of what we do, and mixing them in a weird way. And that was a perfect, perfect change. We were so excited, you know, to be able to give people what they came for, the 35, but still be able to give them the full Yodorowsky experience. And jumping back to Schlockarama, there was another multi-person feat of 
cinematic wizardry that went on when we played the Tingler, which I think we might have talked about a little before, but not with Rob. So when the Tingler was released to indoor theaters, you know, it's the famous story about the seats that were wired up and with buzzers and might give people a little vibration or shock at a certain point in the movie when the lights go out. For drive-ins, they couldn't do that. So they had a different version, a different print that would go out to drive-ins where the screen goes black and you hear William Castle's voice say, uh, flash your lights or honk your horn instead of scream for your lives indoors. So with Harry's suggestion and a little bit of my help and Rob's help and Carl's help, we were able to recreate that at the drive-in. And uh, do you want to talk about how we did that? Sure. That was um, thanks to Harry's incredible resources. He had CDs with the recording of the alternate audio for Drive-In when you play that movie. And looking at it with that exhibition in mind, it's really genius how William Castle went about setting it up because the sequence in question takes place inside of a movie theater. And the Tingler, which is this monster that actually lives inside everyone's spinal cord, escapes and it's crawling across the screen. And there's probably a good eight or 10 seconds there where there's no audio. It's just the Tingler crawling across the screen, just the silhouette of the monster. It looks kind of like a centipede. And that is perfect because it gives the projectionist or whoever it has to do it the time to get the audio changed for the alternate audio in this case, because we're a drive-in. So while the movie's playing, and I watched the movie the night before, so I was very fresh on it, I was in the projection booth with our regular patron, Carl, who on the soundboard had the alternate audio queued up. And at the right moment, he hit that and I turned off the audio from the projectors. So everyone watching the movie got the drive-in version instead of the indoor theater version of that sequence. And you could tell that it worked because everyone was honking their horns and flashing their lights on the screen. It was legitimately hair raising. And I was in the front row and I, it was seamless. Like if you didn't know that was the way it was supposed to be, you would have thought that that was just, that was how the print was. And it wasn't, it was something that you guys did sort of live while the projector was still running with the other audio not being heard to the, to the people in their cars. It was just, it was one of the highlights of the season for me was seeing that work so flawlessly. There were a few people I talked to who didn't even realize, although, I, I'm not sure if it was on the print or if it was something to do with how I was adjusting the receiver, but I understand there was a slight drop off in the audio on the movie before we changed over to the new audio off the CD. But thankfully, it was minimal and didn't seem to affect the experience in any significant way. It seems like we hit it out of the park. And you probably remember what we ended up doing after the movie, too. We let uh, you let the film run out so that the the bare bulb was shining on the screen. So a white screen, essentially. Harry had purchased a facsimile tingler and JT went outside and he held that in front of the projector beam so that the shadow of the tingler was on the screen. And it was great. People were screaming and honking their horns. <laughs> Harry on top. That was an idea I had with just moments to spare. I'm really glad that I did because it wouldn't have worked out if I had thought of it any later. I had to find James at the last minute, grab him, get him in place. And uh, I'm not usually that kind of a showman as far as being animated like that on a live set or, or whatever you want to describe our circumstances as. But that was maybe my favorite single moment of the year because everything just came together perfectly. And when you have an excellent audience that is game for that kind of fun I think that when you can find something like that, it's it's absolutely beautiful, even if it's a silly movie like that. And sometimes even it's especially if it's a silly movie like that. Oh, yeah. Jumping into September, we had Camp Blood. We had Back to the Future Trilogy. We had Universal Monsters. And we had Weekend of Terror with multiple guests. Anything stand out for you over that uh, span? Uh, Weekend of Terror was a lot of fun, what with the um, three different guests from Texas Chainsaw Massacre there. Yeah. Michael Berryman was there, and he was such a gentleman. He was such a, a wonderful person, and being able to watch him watching The Hills Have Eyes from the projection booth was 
absolutely something I'm going to remember for the rest of my life. He was sort of giving us a live audio commentary. I was in there during the movie, too. And he would keep coming in and looking and saying, oh, this part, here's how he did this. And it was like, it was fantastic. He was such a cool guy, still clearly excited about this movie he had made in 1976, probably. And I'm so glad I decided to sit that movie out and hang out in the projection booth because I would have missed that amazing experience had I gone out in my car. Yeah, he's a great talker, great friend. Yeah, that, that's maybe my favorite Wes Craven movie too. So it was it was really, really a treat. There are times when it pays to miss the movies because you get an experience that's even more rare than seeing these movies on 35, which is already extremely desirable. It just seems to be no shortage of it. I'm I'm getting a lot of uh, endorphins, I guess is the word, from, from this uh, throwdown memory lane right now. <laughs> it's an added perk to what we do. We have become a space for guests to come out and meet and greet fans. But, you know, we're sucked up in it and we almost forget sometimes when they walk in. They, they may not have seen 35 millimeter in years. They may not have had a, an experience at a drive-in in years. And when they get so excited, it really does. It like sparks the fire in our belly so much more. It truly does. And it's um, no shortage of people who've come in to watch the movies from the projection booth. There was um, the last weekend with D. Wallace coming in to watch some of Cujo from the projection booth, which was exceedingly cool. Yeah. And uh, to throw back to David Lynch weekend, Rebecca Del Rio had not planned to stay, but she decided she wanted to watch the movie. And she came into the projection booth in order to watch her scene from the projection booth, which is extremely cool. And yeah. uh, before I forget, I wanted to mention by name the guest who made the generous donation earlier that permitted Rebecca Del Rio to attend, and that's Ken Phillips. He handles a lot of Twin Peaks fan events, is my understanding, with his uh, organization 119. If I'm incorrect about any of the particulars there. I apologize, but he's a big fan in the community and he footed the bill to get Rebecca there. Otherwise, we would have all been very deprived. Thank you, Ken. Everybody show him some love. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And we're so blessed in that way. You know, a lot of times when these big events come together, it's it's such a group effort. That weekend in particular, Faye really does. She's, she's above and beyond a partner in this effort to bring people out and make sure that everybody has an amazing time. Rebecca took a real liking to you. I got to say, she, she, I think she fell in love with you a little bit that weekend. I made a very good friend. I remember as well, Amelia and Linnea Quigley, when they were there, they were loving the projection booth and uh, the kind of tour around the projection booth. So many great memories thinking back on it. Um, and of course, October, we had Tarantino, A Go-Go, Freddy Fest, Volume 3, Medieval Mahoning, Tim Burton Weekend, and our Halloween Closing Weekend, which was packed full of three events. Uh, anything jump out there? Obviously, running Tarantino's prints, always a treat, right? Um, it's a treat once you get past the added stress, because the responsibility with his collection, especially when it's his personal copies of the movies is heightened right the first print of his that i ever ran was for our christmas in july weekend when we played black christmas and i could just feel a blood pressure rising but fortunately it was fine everything went pretty much perfectly and his movies are so exquisitely handled and prepared that i know that my job is actually going to be easier when i get to play one of his prints because everything is going to be exactly as it should be and uh, unless something happens with the, um, you know, equipment that you're using, there's very little work that you actually have to do aside from the basics. It's uh, actually the most ideal situation I think you can be in. That last month had the Tim Burton weekend is probably the highlight for me. Being a very late season sellout, kind of unexpected. Yeah, out of nowhere. And it was so busy. You know, the, the, the amount of people in the concession stand, I don't think dwindled until the first movie was just about over. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mark. The line began somewhere around 6.30, let's say, not long after Gates, and it did not dissipate until well into that second film. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty much what I recall. And 
I had the idea pretty early in the evening that, you know, there's so many people who couldn't get in in time because it's late in the season and it's dark earlier and we can't stay up forever. We can't ask people to wait forever for us to start the movie. So we did what many drive-ins will do when they have a really big weekend, which is they play an encore. A lot of theaters will play the first movie after the second movie's over a second time. And we did just that. So the people who missed the beginning of our first feature were able to stick around after the second show and watch it or watch that movie again in its entirety. And there weren't a whole lot of people still awake at that hour, but the ones who were were very grateful. And I'll tell you what, again, another kind of notch uh, but for Robert, because it's like not many projectionists would say, hey, can I stay an extra two and a half hours and make sure that everybody gets a perfect experience here? It's it's really a great touch. And like I said, when we shouted you out for your birthday, you really came to us at the perfect time. You've always been in the family, but as far as working with the Mahoning and uh, becoming a part of the uh, inner circle family behind the scenes, you saved us at the end of last year. And moving into this year, I can't imagine not having you there. You become absolutely ideal, absolutely perfect. So for that, uh, we, we truly thank you. That comes from the crew and I'm sure the fans. There are a lot of people who have said as much and it's very humbling. I am really grateful for the opportunity. It's you know extremely rare, as I've said before, to be able to watch these movies on film. People who pass up these events are going to regret it because they might never happen again. We can only play so many movies every year and... You know, there's some that we'll bring back because they're guaranteed to sell tickets, but we can't bring everything back and we might not be able to play something on film again for reasons that we can't foresee. Maybe the print will disappear. Maybe whoever owns the print will say, well, I'm going to charge you $1,000 to rent it. That's why we haven't been able to play certain movies on 35. But the uh, opportunity to play them is so rare and probably my biggest disappointment of the season that was something out of my hands was the good, the bad, and the ugly, which you've probably discussed on the podcast before. Oh, yeah. I'll just reiterate that I was really looking forward to playing a long movie. I don't think I've projected any movies that are in excess of three hours, and I really want that experience again. When I was a projectionist in my uh, first movie theater job 10 years ago, I think that I played some three-hour movies. Les Miserables comes to mind, but... I want to be able to play the good, the bad, and the ugly. I want to be able to play Lawrence of Arabia and the Guns of the Navarone, although I don't think that one's quite three hours. You get my drift, though. Oh, yeah. I'm down for long-haul experiences, and I really hope that we get enough people to come out that we can play anything and just fill all the lot. Yeah, that's that's what's exciting, to think about the fact that, you know, obviously there's uh, so much going on with the history of them honing over the last five years, but we're really in our infant stages and there's so many people every year who are still discovering us and becoming more and more a part of the lexicon and, and on people's tongues and minds over the summer season. So it's really exciting to see what happens and where we can go from here. And of course, we had so many other events besides what we went over with, you know, our Sundays, our Tunnel Vision Tuesdays, kind of endless, like I said, almost a hundred events over this season which is just nutty <laughs> anything stand out for the uh sundays or the uh disney or the tuesdays the black hole stands out because that was a favorite of mine as a child and i still think it has some of the best that that last half hour is one of the best things that disney's ever produced in my opinion and the uh fact that we were able to play that on 35 was extremely mind-blowing that was the first time disney let us play a film that wasn't from them mm -hmm. and that's going to open the doors to us playing more movies that for whatever reason they no longer have a 35 millimeter print of that they're willing to loan out i'm sure they have some that they're never going to let out just because it's too risky you know they might not be able to reproduce something for some reason or they're just not in the habit of keeping enough copies that they're able to do so. I don't know what goes on. It's a big company. But the fact that we're able to do anything at all, like playing Nightmare Before Christmas, Disney animation, very cool. And I'm glad that that weekend sold out because it was clearly 
something that I would have pretty much done anything to go to had I not been working that weekend. And aside from it being a very popular movie, it's just such a rare opportunity that I would have hated to see people miss it. Yeah. Well, that's what's great is we we really test the waters, which we've talked about on the podcast before with some of these first time events, some of these titles. And when something works, we certainly keep track of that and keep that in mind as we move into the future. That's why we've become known for so many annual events. When something works, we we kind of love going back to the well and celebrating that. It's kind of what we do and everything we were uh, stand for was going back and, and loving something from the past. So we brought back those good old time flavors. And today they're better than ever. All these delicious treats are waiting for you at the refreshment stand. Delicious fresh popcorn, ice cold cola and candy you know and love ready for you now so you won't have to miss any of the feature come and get them attention please a fifty dollar reward will be paid for information leading to the arrest and conviction of anyone caught stealing our speakers if you accidentally pull a speaker loose don't worry just turn it in there is no charge and we'll appreciate it so I can say it again, coming from the video store. I love the curation aspect of what I do and what we do at the Mahoning Drive-In Theater, kind of finding the perfect films to play together. But in your scenario, you get the pleasure sometimes of putting together a trailer reel. What's that like for you? I know you're kind of limited with what we have, but your wings are spreading a little more and uh, our collection is building a little more as uh, the off season moves in. Yeah, it's it's really a matter of how much time you have to put it together more than anything so far for me. The um, number of trailers we have is impressive, but if you don't know what you have, it's really hard to put together something that fits the show. So when we played A Fistful of Dollars, I wanted to do something with a bunch of Westerns, but we don't really have any trailers for Westerns. So I ended up doing just a couple of big movie type of um you know previews uh, i think that i played the preview for super cop and die hard 2 and grindhouse the idea being that they were all pretty action oriented and that they were in cinemascope format i wanted them to be just as big on our screen as the movie itself was going to be and then when we played uh tombstone this one comes to mind because Again, we don't have Western previews for the most part, unless you count Dances with Wolves. But what I was able to do was put together a bunch of previews that shared cast members with that movie. And that's a prolific cast. You have uh, Sam Elliott and Bill Paxton. And I was able to find a bunch of different movies starring those guys. And I thought that that went over quite well. Going forward, what I'm hoping to do is have a pretty comprehensive database of our trailers based on format based on actors and actresses, based on studios that released them, based on the year of the movie release, and being able to prepare stuff more thoroughly ahead of time so that it's not a matter of, okay, what can I do with the couple extra minutes I have when I'm not doing everything else I need to do to get the show ready. Right. And I know, Mark, you had uh, you have your personal archives as well as uh, the Mahoning archives kind of started to be logged. Yeah, it's the thing is we had a lot of trailers at the Mahoning that were trailers that had just piled up over the years, honestly. And they didn't go too far back in time. They're mostly what everybody's sick of me saying. Mostly I consider them to be too new. They're they're like mid to late 2000s trailers. They don't really go back much earlier than let's say the mid 90s. But once in a while that stuff works for what we're showing. And I had started making a list of all of them and I went in and I reorganized them at the beginning of the season. So they're all alphabetical by letter. So that at least sort of generally know where what we have is. But then people just kept donating bins and bins and boxes of trailers to us. Uh, some quite good, some equally as in my mind useless as what we already had, but it sort of, it, it muddied the water as to what we had. So I have a fairly long list of what we have or what we had at a certain time, but I know part of Rob's plan is to go in the off season and get a more definitive list of what we have and have that spreadsheet, which makes life way easier. So you can search or database, you can go and search, as he said, to find something that works specifically for the show you have. 
I have three Rubbermaid under the bed boxes filled with trailers that I bought from years ago when I was doing indoor shows, retro shows in New Hampshire. And I'll gladly donate those anytime we need them. I'll, I'll sort of try to look ahead at what we're running. And if there's anything I have, which tends to skew 60s to 80s, let's say, I'll bring that down and, and supplement what we have. And occasionally, if we think of it far enough, I'll ask Harry to prepare a reel for us. And for the, I think, was it Fistful of Dollars? For one of the Spaghetti Westerns, he provided us with a reel of all Spaghetti Western trailers. Oh, it was so fantastic. Good. Yeah. And he doesn't really mind doing it as long as we give him fair enough warning because he's pulling from the Exhumed archive, which has to be one of the greatest trailer archives there is that I can imagine. I'm sure the new Beverly has one to rival it, but in, in any private hands, it, it's insanely it's deep. So trailers really set the tone. The pre-show sets a nice tone for the night. So we all want to try to make that as cool as we can and help you know, put people back in time or show them a trailer that they love or a trailer for a movie they've never heard of that looks really cool. Um, that Those trailer trauma shows were fantastic this year where you got two and then I think three hours of trailers, many of which I'd never seen before. Um, they, those were just amazing. So rest assured, anybody who likes the Mahoning that uh, we're all working to make that uh, pre-show as cool as it can be. Oh, yeah. I have two big projects in mind, or well, one of them is a big project in mind for the off season. And the one is to organize the trailers. So I know precisely what we have because case in point, it wasn't until I think the last weekend of the year this year that I realized we have an original trailer for Jaws yes. in the projection booth. We did. And it just been kind of stuck in the back of the, of the bookshelf the whole time. It's like some of them I know offhand and I'm never going to, like the the preview for Saw Three, I'm never gonna run that. Yeah. But <laughs> what about employee? Like of um, How do you feel I mean, about if we, if we if we play something with one of those cast members? Maybe <laughs> having never seen that movie, I'm infinitely more inclined to it than something like Saw Three. <laughs> but um, you know, I'm I'm doing somewhat like you, Mark. I'm I'm buying trailers. I just bought a bunch of trailers off of eBay from one user who was uh, generous enough to make a discount and then when you buy a bunch of things at once they generally give you a refund on your shipping as well which is excellent yeah. and um i picked up trailers for uh blazing saddles and the fury oh. and video drone and dead men don't wear plaid and oh. i can't wait to work those in our shows the other project i have is to read the book the art of film projection from george eastman wow, museum awesome it is subtitled A Beginner's Guide, and that is perfect because, in my opinion, I'm still a beginner. I might have a lot more experience than most people, but I am still a beginner, and there's still a lot to learn, and I am looking forward to the opportunity. And that was probably written around the era that our projectors come from. <laughs> so. I believe this is a new book, actually. Oh, is I'm it? Not they updated, but let yeah. me Copyright 2019. Oh, wow. Yep. And, and as if to prove that film is still vital and vibrant. And I know of at least three theaters in the country that have reinstalled film projectors or that have opened with film projectors recently. And I like to think that we're starting uh, uh, or at least on on kind of the, the wave of a bit of a renaissance. You know, vinyl came back. Why not film? Oh, yeah. I love that. I'm sure the fans of the Mahoning uh, can get behind that in a big, bad way. It's such a, a, a unique thing, again, going back to the trailers. It's an extension of, of the curation and what we do. I love when a trailer reel hits and the crowd goes nuts. You know, it's it's almost like getting a, a, a surprising opening act at a rock concert where you're like, all right, wasn't expecting this, curveball. As you leave the theater, folks, please be careful. Don't let this happen to your car. Be sure to remove the speaker before you leave. If you should accidentally pull a speaker loose, please turn it in at our snack bar or box office. Thank you. Well, again, Robert, we can't thank you enough, not just for making the time to come on the podcast, but everything that you do for the Mahoning, uh, everything that you've given us this year and moving into next season. And it's such a unique scenario that we have at the Mahoning. And I know Robert and I have talked about it, but what we do is is so special like what other place is the projectionist kind of looked at as the rock star of of the outfit you know people come into that booth and are just kind of gobsmacked watching um robert and jeff at work and seeing the old equipment and 
again, we're so lucky to have you um, there to, to field questions and give people kind of that welcoming atmosphere that the Mahoning is known for. It's a blessing and a curse, truly. And, and I only say that because sometimes you're really pressed for time. There's a lot of work to do and you just can't give people the tour that you want to of the place. You can't take the time because you need to get the show ready. The show has to take precedence. But when you do have the time, it's such a wonderful thing. And one of my favorite memories this year that I didn't get to mention yet is when my friend Matt came to the drive-in for the first time. My friend Matt uh, lives in Cincinnati currently, but I knew him for a time in New York City. And he came with my friend Simon as well. Simon's a bit of a regular at the drive-in and actually wrote the article yes. about us in the New York yes. Times. And when Matt was able to come for the first time, and I knew that he would fall in love with the place, but I didn't think that he would fall as hard and as quickly as he did. And he said something to the effect of, um, he described me as like a monk learning an old religion <laughs> that was being forgotten. That's and it was one of the best things I'd ever heard. And uh, I, I, then I got to play the brood for him on 35 millimeter, which was just sublime. I know I've used that word before, but it bears repeating. And, and I can't wait to get Matt back. Unfortunately, he's a, a very busy man. He's writing books. He's playing movies at other theaters for people doing stuff kind of like what we do. And uh, I, I, I really hope to be able to play movies for him again there in the future. Well, he's got a home here, just like, uh, you know, all of our listeners and fans do. We'll be back again in April, but you guys know it. You can cozy on up to the podcast and the social medias to keep your finger on the pulse. And the online store, I got to mention it because people are asking about anything special for the holidays, things like that. Yes, you can actually snag a gift card for your Mahoning fan, your loved ones, whatever the case is. And uh, it's a great way to support the Mahoning and also the Patreon. Mark, why don't you let them know about the Patreon goodness? The Patreon goodness is www.patreon.com forward slash Mahoning Drive-In. And it has three levels of membership. You don't know what Patreon is. It's basically a monthly subscription. You can pay $4.99, $9.99, or $19.99 and get various levels of content and benefits from that. When the theaters open during the year, you can get discounts and such. And when the theater is closed, we do, uh, well, when the theaters open, the highest level gets a free monthly screening of a mystery film from our vaults or one that we borrow from somebody. Usually it's very strange drive-in, rarely screened drive-in kind of stuff. We're continuing that online. We did our first one for November and it was a really so good much time. Fun. We're, doing it, we're doing it through Zoom. We're still showing rare stuff. We're actually now showing things starting in December from the vaults of AGFA, the American Genre Film Archive, or film, I shouldn't say from the vaults, films that AGFA distributes. So that actually covers multiple video labels like Arrow, Vinegar Syndrome and others and strange rare titles that they happen to have access to. So once a month, uh, Simplex members, that's the 19, that's not people who need a special cream or a shot. <laughs> that's people who are at the 1999 level. They get a, a free show. Then you can sort of chat along in the text chat with that. And we do a DJ set and do a prize giveaway and all that stuff. So Patreon is out there and uh, there's some exclusive videos. We shot most of the Q and A's that occurred at the drive-in I recorded this season. You can see those in full on video via our Patreon and on and on and on. You're the best intros, all that stuff. If you guys uh, want to get down with the get down, come on over and join us at Patreon. Um, all right, guys, it's been a treat until next time. Jeff, take it away, my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for coming out tonight to the Mahoning Drive-In Theater. We hope you'll come back and see us again real soon. The exit is on the right hand side of the screen at the front of the field. And most importantly, have a very safe trip home. Good night and God bless you.